April 9th, 1864. A hundred and fifty years ago, the Battle of Pleasant Hill was fought. It was the second major engagement during the Red River Campaign, and was fought between the Union Army of the Gulf under General Nathaniel P. Banks and General Richard Taylor's Army of the Trans-Mississippi on the Confederacy side. The battle was a follow-up to the previous day's action at Mansfield, and was a, essentially a rear guard or a retreating action. The Union Army, which had been defeated the previous day at Mansfield, was retreating, and the Confederate Army was pursuing and attempting to destroy the Union Army before it could reorganize following its defeat at Mansfield. Mansfield was much of a meeting engagement in which the Union Army uh, fought a series of defensive positions against Confederate attacks. Despite the Confederates being outnumbered, they overwhelmed several Union positions and pushed them back multiple times. Pleasant Hill, however, was a, a slightly different affair. The Union Army wasn't as, as spread out and was more or less in a more solid defensive position. It wasn't a meeting engagement or a running battle as Mansfield was. It was a, a very different engagement. And where the Battle of Mansfield nearly turned into a rout, the Battle of Pleasant Hill was actually a Union victory. The United States was able to hold off the Confederates despite several near misses and was able to ensure its army's survival and its eventual continued retreat. In this sense, it was much in the way that some of the Seven Days battles were, in that General Lee, during the early Seven Days, did fight a successful engagement at Gaines Mill, and the following battles were retreating and rear guard actions in which the Union Army was continually victorious, but at the same time continued to be driven away from its objective of Richmond. In this case, the Red River Campaign's objective was Shiverport, and the Union Army, which had been defeated the previous day at Mansfield, despite holding off the Confederates, uh, was not able to regain the momentum. Uh, it was a narrow-run thing, and the victory as it was was only in t a tactical scale. Strategically, they were still outmaneuvered and continued to retreat. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is The Historical Gamer, and today I'm going to be taking a look at the Battle of Pleasant Hill using the game Scourge of War Gettysburg. Uh, the Battle of Pleasant Hill is part of the Red River Campaign mod, uh, which was released uh, just a couple of months back, and is a mod which provides a new map for the Battle of Pleasant Hill, as well as several of the Red River Campaign battles, uh, as well as... Um, discussing the historical significance and uh, occurrences of this battle. So uh, it's been a little while since the last battle. battle. I usually try and do videos uh, roughly on par with the 150th anniversary uh, with some of these videos. And uh, while I was a little bit late with Mansfield, I'm also a little bit late here with Pleasant Hill. Uh, today that I'm recording this is May April 30th, so as I said, the battle did take place on April 9th. I am recording this for the Wargamer.com, so if you're watching me over there, I appreciate that. If you're watching me on my YouTube channel, go ahead and, and go over there and check out thewargamer.com. It's a great website for anyone interested in historical uh, war games, uh, PC games, they cover some board games, they also do historical articles. So anyone who's really interested in history or warfare or video games should really go and check that out. It's a, it's a nice location uh, for uh, more niche games that aren't quite as focused on the mainstream, um, and uh, they do some mainstream stuff as well. Uh, but anyway, uh, it's been a couple of weeks since uh, since my last video here. I've uh, been in the process of moving, so I've um, been a little bit uh, distracted uh, or a little bit uh, unavailable. I've got a really cool setup at the new place, but that's not really the point of this video. So um, without further ado, let's talk about the Battle of Pleasant Hill. All right, so as we were talking about, the Battle of Pleasant Hill was a continuation of the previous day's engagement at the Battle of Mansfield. As we said, on April 8, 1864, the Union Army under General Nathaniel P. Banks was dealt a drubbing in uh, the Battle of Mansfield in which it was defeated. The battle didn't start till the afternoon, and despite the near rout of the Union Army, uh, which I recreated in my previous video for the series, the Union retreated in, in disorder. Now, the Union did take up new positions near Mansfield Hill, or sorry, Pleasant Hill, and uh, brought up defensive positions. The battle was essentially a continuation of Mansfield, so in some sense, despite what I said earlier, it was a running engagement, only that it was a position further down the line, if you will, that the Union took up as a result of their defeat the previous day's battle. Now, uh, the Union took a position along the Pleasant Hill. I have trees turned off right here on the screen that you can see um, 
to make it easier to see, but this is a very heavily wooded area, and Pleasant Hill was. Now, what I'm doing, and, and I'm tr I tried to research the battle a little bit to try and you know figure out where all these positions were. My, my soldiers kind of start out in an exposed position, uh, way off here in, in advance of kind of a, a better defensive line back toward uh, this town. Um, in toward where Pleasant Hill actually is located and, and historically the Union you know they took the brunt of the initial Confederate attack they were driven back and then they ended up holding their position so you, the Union did you know did hold their ground and, and I guess I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here but basically the Union Army had been driven back at Mansfield they took up defensive positions at Pleasant Hill the following day the morning was spent mainly with some probing actions and some skirmishes. The main attacks didn't start till 5 o'clock, and I find that somewhat interesting um, because it seems in this campaign most of the battles, Mansfield was the same way, started late in the afternoon, too late to fully exploit a, a decisive victory, and um, in that sense, Pleasant Hill was the same. Granite. It wasn't a decisive victory for anyone. The Union held their ground despite a fierce engagement, but it, it didn't start till 5 o'clock. That's not a lot of time. That's that's when the main Confederate attack started, was around 5 o'clock. The initial Confederate attack uh, drove a Union forces, some Union forces out of their positions along the Union left flank. A counterattack from the Confederate, from the Union uh, allowed them to regain some of those some of the ground they had lost and in other places their lines simply firmed up and the Union more or less held their defensive position. There you can see the trees switched back on. But it's interesting that again the majority of the morning was spent probing. There was no rush to attack the Union so quickly after their defeat the previous day's battle. And I wonder, you know, what the difference would have been if there had been a push made to launch an attack sooner. But I digress. Uh, we've already talked in the previous video, again, uh, which is linked here in the description if you want to check it out, about General Nathaniel P. Banks. We've al already also talked about General Richard Taylor, the commander of the Confederate forces, uh, and I don't see much need to discuss them further here as I kind of play through this battle. Now, real quick, interjecting some, some historical commentary is I'm pulling my two, I have two brigades that are very far forward, and I'm pulling them back toward this town here, um, toward this open open spot in the trees where there are some fields in order to form a more cohesive defense because we've kind of got a solid line there but we've got a hole right through the middle of the town uh, and, and we need to fill that otherwise we're pretty exposed and the, the confederates could drive straight through our position here we're taking on the role of general nathaniel banks so i'm going to pull these regiments back if i can um, they are pretty much too too far forward to be able to put up an effective defense and already flanked in some cases. I don't think I'm going to get both brigades back, uh, but I am hoping to get at least some of these soldiers back here. So jumping forward a little bit, as you can see on the map here, the blue units represent my units. I was able to pull one brigade back pretty much without too much loss. You can see those blue units on the left side of the map, though, are pretty much isolated. They're facing off some troops to their front, but the enemy also has troops to their rear and on their flank. So that brigade is pretty much lost, but I'm trying to get this other brigade here, these troops you see filing into position here, were actually out exposed as well. Uh, to kind of form up along this other brigade, which is back toward Pleasant Hill, toward this open area. We've got some Confederate forces coming here. We've kind of got formed our own little salient, which is definitely not an ideal situation. A salient is a position in which uh, a defensive force can bring fewer rifles to bear on the attackers than the attackers can bring on themselves. So usually some form of angle, maybe like a 45 degree angle, a 90 degree angle, something where you're position is stretched out on a way in which you have, you know, on an angle you, you've got one line, if you will. Let's say you have a 45 degree angle, you basically have two lines that intersect with each other. Both can fire forward, but at the tip of that angle, or at a 90 degree angle, if you can just envision it, at the tip of that angle, you've only got a couple of rifles that you can bring to bear, unlike a straight line, or, um, you know, a concave, if you will. So, 
at the point of that angle, you've got less firepower that you can bring to bear because the line kind of bends away. So some of your guys are firing off to the left, some of your guys are firing off to the right, and only a very few are firing forward. Uh, so an attacker always wants to move forward on a salient uh, because it's an exposed position. It's a position in which if you're attacking a salient, you're going to face less firepower against you, and you can wrap around that salient and bring more firepower to bear yourself because you've got the opposite of that. Instead of just a few guns pointed out from one specific point, you can kind of wrap around it, uh, if you will, like... Um, I'm trying to think of a good description, like a paper towel or like a piece of paper if you f fold it over your hand, you can bring all your firepower to bear on that one specific point and the enemy can only bring a few rifles to bear against you. So you want to attack a salient there. That's the reason I'm talking about this is I kind of had form my own one, so I'm moving these troops, which I moved past this a little bit, but I'm moving some troops forward into the woods to kind of try and give me more of a straight line as opposed to a salient because a salient's a very vulnerable position. Um, so there you can see there I moved two regiments forward so I've got that straight line rather than maybe just one corner of a regiment facing this oncoming uh, attack of Confederate cavalry. So there they come here we've got the woods back on I'm gonna turn them back off just because this battle is an incredibly wooded uh, terrain it's hard to see what's going on in many senses it's almost like the wilderness um, in, in as far as playing the game's concerned I, I don't know about the comparison of the actual territory but you can see there the enemies attacked me. A little bit ahistorical with an actually cavalry charge. A lot of these units were cavalry units or were mounted infantry units. It's kind of a, a different setup with the way the battles were fought in the Western theater versus the, uh, you know, the Eastern or Central theaters. There was a much higher uh, makeup of mounted infantry, it seems, um, and also to some extent cavalry, but often the cavalry was not as professional. It was more along the lines of what we might today consider uh, more like a, a militia. Um, but there you can see the enemy has, has brought a significant amount of firepower to bear on that one regiment. It wasn't really a salient, but they definitely were able to isolate it and uh, are threatening my entire line here with, with a breach here in the middle. So I'm going to try and rush some reinforcements in to kind of plug the gap and hopefully uh, stop this Confederate, uh, this Confederate attack before it really uh, does too much damage there. They've, they've burst a hole in my line. Fortunately, I've got regiments on either side that limit how much they can exploit it, hopefully, and then I'll bring some of my cavalry uh, from down the line uh, over here. I'll bring some of these guys in to try and help plug this gap before uh, the enemy can exploit it. Jumping forward a minute or two, uh, I've got some of my troops here in position. I've got one cavalry regiment over there you just saw briefly in position. You can still, you see some of my troops out here are still fighting off the enemy. They're definitely doing a good job of, of holding the enemy up and delaying them. I've got a battery of artillery and a, you know, a couple of regiments of infantry totally cut off and surrounded, but uh, they're putting up a fight. They're not surrendering, so they're buying me some time. They're holding, you know, they're, they're holding the enemy off and, and buying the rest of my army some time. Um, sacrificially of course but anyway so that one regiment here you see firing these guys right around there uh, they are a cavalry regiment I'm also bringing another one in so I'm gonna have two regiments here plug this hole and then hopefully I can you know shore up my position here and uh, and hold my ground um, now as I was saying historically the Battle of Pleasant Hill uh, was a follow-on engagement to Mansfield, which I know I've said a couple of times. The Confederates launched some attacks in the afternoon, which again, it was interesting to me that attacks didn't begin till around 5 o'clock, despite the, the fact that it was a follow-on engagement. And in many senses, this is really a similar battle to the Peninsular Campaign. I would have likened Mansfield to Gaines Mill, all the Union was definitely driven from the field in more disorder. Uh, and then, you know, Pleasant Hill was certainly no Malvern Hill, but it might have been comparable uh, to some of the other uh, follow-ons of, um, of the Seven Days Campaign. I'm trying to think of some of the names there. Um, some of the names of those other battles. Uh, so, uh, what was it again? There was Gaines Mill, uh, the Union withdrew, and maybe Savage Station, or Glendale, or, you know, some of those engagements. Uh, the Union did hold, but it was certainly no massacre. In fact, in this engagement, uh, the Confederates, who were considered the tac tactically defeated, lost about a total of 1,600 men. The Union lost about 1,300. Uh, both sides ended up having about 12,000 engaged, so roughly similar casualties. 
the Union Army, however, was in worse shape. Despite the victory, if you will, uh, the morale of the Union Army was shot. The defeat at Mansfield had, had largely demoralized the force, and uh, they were really not in any shape to take the fight to the Confederates. The Confederates uh, were defeated in only that they didn't drive the Union from their positions. In fact, some historians do argue uh, that because the Union continued their retreat, you could argue the battle was a success for the Confederacy. Uh, the battle resulted in the Union abandoning their attempts to take uh, Shiverport and uh, essentially ensured the Red River campaign would end in Union failure. Uh, you could certainly make the argument that Mansfield had already done that, but the, uh, the way in which the Battle of Pleasant Hill fought out, in which the Confederates were driven back initially and then only barely clung to their positions and uh, kind of just survived the Confederate onslaught, uh, kind of gives credence to the, the idea that maybe if this battle hadn't occurred, Banks would have been able to, to regather the army, to restore some order, some morale to the army, and given his men a chance to, to regroup and fight another day. But by uh, Confederate General Richard Taylor, by him pressing his advantage and attacking the Union, despite not breaking the army physically, uh, ensured that their morale remained low, uh, that they in continued their retreat under pressure, and that um, they abandoned any hope of a counterattack. Uh, maybe from a mental standpoint more than a physical standpoint, you know. Uh, we were beaten, and, and then we weren't given any time to recover, or you know, mentally, uh, and despite you know, barely clinging to life, we clearly feel we need to continue withdrawing, and, and General Nathaniel Banks would continue the retreat following uh, the Battle of Pleasant Hill. Now, that was not the end of the Red River Campaign. Um, I, I did not talk about this battle too much in depth, because it was pretty simple. You know, it was an attack that lasted a couple of hours. This scenario lasts about an hour itself, um, and, you know, the the Union held their ground and continued retreating. It was a pretty straightforward fight, uh, and as I, you know, as I've already said, and um, in that sense, nothing remarkable from a tactical standpoint. Uh, Richard Taylor did know his enemy, though, and, and was able to ensure the campaign's victory here. However, the Union Army was not out of the woods. In fact, uh, this battle was only the beginning. Uh, the Union forces would be begin a very a, a, a retreat that was uh, in complete disorder and um, nearly resulted in the destruction of the Union Army of the Gulf. Uh, the Red River, which was the body of water which flowed from the Mississippi to Shiverport, which the Union Army advanced along toward Shiverport, uh, would actually become the focal point of the retreat. and. Uh, Interestingly enough, the tide in the river began to drop, and is it's my understanding that some Union gunboats and some Union cottonclads and other vessels uh, were basically drawing too deep, the water was getting too shallow, and uh, it nearly resulted in the destruction of the Union Army in its retreat from uh, the combined battles of Mansfield and Pleasant Hill. Now, I am going to talk a little bit more about that retreat in the follow-on videos, uh, because this is a mod which includes uh, more than just two, these two battles. Uh, in fact, there were a couple of smaller engagements which were fought toward the end of the campaign, uh, starting on April 30th with, I believe, the Battle of Yellow Bayou, um, and then a couple of other engagements as well, both between the Union forces in northern Arkansas and the Union forces in retreating along the Red River. It's worth mentioning that the Red River campaign was not strictly a campaign with General Nathaniel Banks being involved with this Army of the Gulf. There was a Union army that was advancing from uh, the north of Arkansas, you know, in Missouri, uh, down south. It was almost a pincer effect with a smaller army coming south. If you are more familiar with the eastern campaigns, you could compare it again to the Seven Days, in which uh, General McClellan was advancing with the main force from the east to the west on Richmond, up the peninsula, and then as that attack bogged down, another Union force under General Pope uh, would advance from the north directly south toward uh, Richmond, um, 
in that case it ended up leading to a much more major battle and forces were shifted, etc., etc. So the sim similarities in the campaign end there because of the distances being much greater, but still, um, I digress. The Red River Campaign after the Battle of Pleasant Hill was not over. It was not even close to over. Uh, but the Union hope of victory was. At this point, at the end of that, at the end of the Battle of Pleasant Hill, the only thing the Union could really hope for any longer in the Red River Campaign was that their force could escape successfully without being destroyed. And that's what the future engagements would be about, with the exception of the engagements in the North. Now here in my scenario, I've actually done a pretty good job of holding the Confederates off. I did get that one brigade, you know, I couldn't withdraw it. There were two brigades up front. I pulled one of them back and it helped for them this defensive line. The other brigade has unfortunately uh, more or less been entirely destroyed. So my army has lost, you know, a solid brigade. I think it had about 1,600 men. Obviously not all of them are killed or dead, but as far as effectives, you know, that's a pretty big blow to an army of about 12,000. That's, you know, over 10% of its force. And um, you can see there, it looks like there's still a couple of regiments sort of fighting it out, but they're definitely going to be destroyed. The rest of my line, however, is formed into a pretty strong defensive line. I, I wore a main Confederate attack here on my right flank. It looks like they're just kind of skirmishing with me over here on this flank. I don't think there's any serious threat. They haven't made a push on the rest of my main defensive line, so at this point... I think we're pretty good and well and safe, and then the rest of my army is kind of back behind the river here um, that I don't have control over because they haven't been engaged. Um, but again, um, all in all, this battle looks to be won. Maybe not a major victory. You know, I didn't rout the Confederates. I lost heavily, uh, but uh, I suppose they could still press hard on me, but so far they haven't. They've just moved a couple of regiments forward. Definitely nothing that's going to be strong enough to kick me out of my own positions here. And uh, why don't we jump forward a bit just to see what happens with this. Alright, so jumping ahead here a bit, you can see I've got several regiments in line here. Uh, moved some reinforcements up, uh, kind of just to strengthen my overall position. There's still a general engagement that's being fought out along the entire line, uh, but I've pretty well held my line, held my position. One thing that does make this scenario or this campaign a little bit more interesting, I didn't play the carryover camp or the carryover scenario, but there's there's two versions of the Battle of Pleasant Hill. There's a version that has just the standard historical setup for both the Confederates and the Union, and then there's a carryover which allows you to take casualties that you took in the Battle of Mansfield, and then you know you'll be re those those troops that you lost in that first battle. It'll save your order of battle essentially from the first battle carried over to the second battle so if you lose that first battle really badly or if you're too aggressive and you lose really heavy casualties that's going to obviously have a big impact on your ability to to successfully fight in the second battle of the campaign because you're going to start off with you know your 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 army minus what you lost in the first day uh, first day's engagement which is kind of a neat thing that the scourge of war uh, game does uh, some scenarios are those carryover scenarios where you have those casualties from the first day or from earlier in the day and then you know they're applied to your later battles which does make your decision making a little bit more critical uh, the nice thing about this mod is that it gives you both the historical battle of Pleasant Hill and Mansfield and it also allows you if you like to have carryover casualties so you're not forced into it um, you've got the option to play it however you want uh, but if that is something that interests you that's obviously a, a reason to take a look at it um, these types of scenarios and games are really awesome to me in that they, they really uh, kind of highlight that mobile kind of um, campaign, you know, something something that, like, uh, you know, I think would fit a campaign or an operational level part of a game really well. Um, but uh, anyway, sorry, before I just start randomly ran rambling... Um, that's going to be about it. You know, we're looking around here on the defensive lines, and uh, we look pretty strong. Again, the enemy is still pressing us, but it's it's not a concerted effort. They're not up in our face, and there's they're just not 
doing enough damage. You know, we're just engaged in a stand-up fight in which our guys are holding our own and inflicting more than they got. And even if they push through that line, we've got a whole other line of fresh infantry behind them where they're attacking. So, I just the enemy's not going to be able to push through these lines. I can tell you that right now. They can maybe push a couple of regiments back. Maybe some of my guys will run into ammo problems. But I've got supply wagons back there, and that's one of those things in this game is if uh, your troops do have ammunition and if they run out, they need to resupply. Obviously, if they don't have any ammo, they're going to run away. They're not going to just stand there with empty muskets. Um, so really, you know, at this point, this battle is going to be a victory. Probably not a major victory because I did lose that entire brigade, just basically destroyed and pushed back. Uh, but the enemy's not making a serious effort on my right flank. They're not making an effort on my left flank. And in the center, it's just kind of a kind of a, a light. Uh, maybe I'd call it more of a probing action than an actual engagement. Um, so you know, at this point, that's going to about do it for us. Uh, I do want to thank you for, for tuning into the video. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. It was a little bit less of a historical discussion than uh, than the previous video, but again, you know, this is a follow-on to the first battle, so if you are interested in, in General Nathaniel Banks, uh, who was the commander of the Union Force, if you're interested in learning about Richard Taylor, the son of the pres U.S. President, and also the conf the commander of the Confederate Forces uh, at the Battle of Pleasant Hill and Mansfield, uh, check out my Battle of Mansfield video on thewargamer.com. It's linked in the description, and and um, thanks for watching. Until next time, this is the Historical Gamer, signing out.